Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This is the second part of the one we started last week talking about the clouds, Jesus coming in the clouds, appearing in the clouds. Let's go back to our, our first three sets of verses to get kind of where we're going with this. And then we're going to tie it in with, with probably one of the most important phrases or events to take place in Bible prophecy. It's called the day of the Lord. Now, everybody's got a different opinion about the day of the Lord. Well, the day of the Lord is, is, is this, it's that. And since this, you know, since it says a day, then everything must happen in one 24 hour day. But I don't believe that that's necessarily true. I think the day of the Lord can mean Number one, a physical 24-hour day, but also mean what Peter said and what the psalm says about what a day is. A day of the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So the day of the Lord is, to me, the day that, first of all, when Christ begins to Let's say it starts when Jesus receives the book out of the right hand of God. Let's, let's just guess and say it could start then. And that initiates everything that's going to happen after that that falls within the category of, of the day of the Lord. Some of it going to happen in one day. Some of it going to happen early, maybe the first few years, but then the entirety of the day of the Lord is a thousand years. And at the end of the day of the Lord, well, Satan's going to get put in the lake of fire. Woo -hoo! God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth have passed away and there are no more sea and there's going to, there's not going to be any more days because then we'll live in eternity all right let's start out matthew 24 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Notice that. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So again, we have the Son of Man coming down from heaven, appearing in the clouds. We have the sound of the trumpet. We have the angels gathering together all of God's elect, just like, and we have an example of that. We have Elijah. Elijah what came down from heaven to separate Elijah from Elisha? A chariot of fire and a horse of fire. You know what that was? That was an angel, wasn't it? We've learned that from studying the chariots and the, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So what's to say that God, when he sends these angels out, all these angels, aren't four-wheel drive, air-conditioned, GPS chariots, amen, with sunroof and everything. Can't wait. So anyway, so we have all of that listed here, which goes along with 1 Thessalonians 4, Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. So there we have the trump. We have the shout. We have the dead in Christ rising first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, caught up together that's a gathering with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
So we have a connection clearly to me between 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24. In that, we have his elect being gathered together, the angels doing that for us. We have with the great sound of a trumpet, we have a trumpet sounding here. We're going to meet him in the clouds because he's coming in the clouds. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 is followed by 1 Thessalonians 5. That was easy, wasn't it? 1 Thessalonians 5, which says this. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that, here it is, the day of the Lord. So cometh as a thief in the night. Now I could show you something. Isaiah 13, a connection between the day of the Lord and a thief in the night. In Isaiah 13, verse 6, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. So in Isaiah 13, 6, it clearly tells us that this is the day of the Lord. Then it says in verse 8, and all they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. And then it says, The stars of heaven therefore shall not give their light. And the sun shall be darkened and it's going forth. And the moon shall not cause their light to shine. And I will punish the world. And stuff's going to fall out of it. All this stuff we've been talking about. So this, for you know, for you, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night is spoken exactly the same way in Isaiah 13, verses 6, 7, 8, 9. Read all of Isaiah 13. They're the same thing. The day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord associated with? Well, from, from what we're looking at today, the day of the Lord is associated with clouds. Because Christ is coming in the clouds. So, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So, there's only one, only one group of people in, and I'm going to say it, in all of the universe. Yeah, I mean what I say. That's a future teaching I got coming up. Out of all the people, one group escapes. The dead in Christ we which are alive and remain. We will escape. But the rest of the world, no matter where they, no matter how deep a hole they dug, and no matter how far up into the heavens they got, God's going to bring them back down, He's going to dig them back up, and they're going to face the music on the day of the Lord. There's not going to be any escape for the rich and the wealthy and Jeff Bezos and uh, what's his name? The guy used to own PayPal. Elon Musk. There's not going to be an escape for these people. No star cities. No traveling to other planets. They might be able to get there. But God's going to bring them back down. Anyway. So let's, let's move on from there. So we know that this, the translation, is associated with the day of the Lord. And if you want to read the rest of 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, uh, Brethren, ye are not in darkness, that, that that day should overtake you as a thief. It clearly tells us that we're, that we're going to escape it and we're going to know what's going on. The rest of the world, they're all drunk and they're all asleep. 
they won't know. And drunks, what do drunks do? Fall down. And I, I believe it. I've said this before, but I literally believe that angels are going to fall to the earth and all the peoples of the earth are literally going to fall down. Fall, like, like fall down backwards, like people slain in the spirit or masons in the blue lodge who get hit in the head and they fall down backwards. Hmm, imagine that. I think that could very well be what's going to happen. Anyway, let's, let's move on because let's deal with the subject of the day of the Lord and clouds. Because in the day of the Lord, it's a very gloomy, dark, evil day. And I think we should be prepared for that. First Peter prepares it, us for it. He said it's a trial by fire. And it's not all happy day until we get raptured and then it's all going to turn bad. I don't believe that anymore. I used to believe that. I believed that because I wanted to believe that because I was scared. I'm still scared, but I love my Lord. And I am ready to face whatever he brings. Ready. Ezekiel 30. Verse 3, for the day of the Lord is near, or for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. So here's what I've got in mind. Right now, we're in the time of the Gentiles. God's dealing with us. And he's given opportunity for everybody to be saved, Jew, Gentile, even the French. God will save the French if, if they want to be saved. Okay? And then, but when that translate, when that door of the ark is shut, it's going to be the time of the heathen. God's going to deal with them and judge them. He's going to save Israel and protect them, but he's going to judge the heathen of this world. Joel 2, verses 1 and 2. Blow you the trumpet in Zion. Hear that trumpet sounding? And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. There it is. So we have the trumpet. Zion. We read that last week in Hebrews. We're come to Mount Zion. Not Mount Sinai. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great... Now notice, stop right here. Because that cloud that he spreads over the land is not just a fog, a London fog. It's a nation. It's a nation. You say, Pastor, I don't understand it. Remember in Hebrews 12 where he said, see that we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses? All the witnesses that he was talking about was people like Abel, Moses, Noah, Sarah, Abraham, Barak, David, uh, even um, uh, Rahab, the harlot from Jericho. They compass us as a cloud of witnesses. I believe that cloud is what is referred to when Jesus appears in the midst of all of his people. We are surrounding him. He is as a cloud. We are his cloud of witnesses. This is Jesus. Hey, this is Jesus right here, everybody. And everybody says, hey, look, Jesus is here. We are his witnesses. But look at this. As, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. There is a nation 
that God says exists a people that the earth has never seen before. God has held them, let's say, 150 billion galaxies that way. God has held them over there all this time. They've never made an appearance on this earth. God's going to shake the heavens, and boy, here they come. And they're going to be like a cloud to cover the entire world. You remember back in Genesis 9 when God said, When I bring the cloud over the land, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud? God says, When I bring this great people in a strong that have never, ever, the earth has never seen them. Don't worry. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is going to appear in the cloud. Okay? Now notice the connection between that cloud and Ezekiel 38. Verse 7. And Ezekiel 38 is about Gog, the chief prince. Okay? A prince is a principality, a devil. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Now remember, remember on, on the, the day of Noah when it started raining, what were the two sources of the water? Coming down from the heavens, coming up from the earth. That's what we have here. We have two sources, the angels being kicked out of heaven and those that are coming up out of the earth. And God says, I'm just going to cover the whole earth with this cloud of very violent, evil, deadly angels. I want to cover the entire earth with them. No man's going to escape in that day. Your seven years supply of food that you have down in your bunker that you bought. I wouldn't plan on it. I would trust in Jesus and him alone. Job chapter 20. Knowest thou not this of old since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens... And his head reach where? Unto the clouds. Yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. They which have seen him shall say, Where is he? He shall fly away as a dream, and they shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. God is saying there are th these wicked people. Though they mount up to the heavens, and they're going to. I've, I've stated this before. I absolutely believe that the plan is to evacuate some of the elite off of the earth and either put them in a space station that Jeff Bezos is, trying to, is planning uh, or Elon Musk is, or... If you believe some of these Space Force stories, 
Ben Rich, the head of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, said to a graduating class, we already have the technology to take E.T. home. According to some stories that I've heard, and the evidence seems to mount that we have already had people from this earth leave this earth and visit other solar systems. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. And what did God say? Though, though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. God says, I'm going to destroy him anyway. Now, that brought to mind his head reach unto the clouds. Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He's planning on escaping too. To ascend above, to mount up into the heavens and ascend above the heights of the clouds God has already said in Job 20, in Job, listen, Job was the first book of the Bible written. Job was, we think, lived about the same time Abraham did. I don't think they were next door neighbors, but they lived about the same time. And here is Isaiah writing this, boy, man, it's got to be hundreds and hundreds of years, a thousand years later, maybe, I don't know. But he's writing this later of Lucifer saying exactly the same thing. Though the wicked mount up to the heaven in this day of clouds, though they try to get above the cloud. Boy, if you're not convinced from that, would I, let's see, would I be able to read something out of the Bible and convince you? Hmm. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. A city. Like Jeff Bezos wants. He wants one of those rotating cities up in heaven. Remember like in the movie, um, um, oh, I can't remember what it was called. Jodie Foster and Matt Damon. Uh, where they had a floating city up there in the heavens. And everybody wanted to go to it. That was where the elite was. Listen, that's in their minds right now. That's where they want to go because they know the storm cloud's coming. They know it's coming. And they figure that if they can get above the heights of the clouds and mount up to the heavens, that they can escape it. But friends, you and I, we're the only ones who have the escape plan. And it's through Jesus Christ. Amen. Elysium. Uh, that was the name of the movie. And that was the name of the city up there, Elysium. You'll see this again. Anyway, Amos 9. Look at this. I saw the Lord. For all of my flat earth friends, which aren't... I don't have any flat earth friends, I don't think. They all hate me. Who say it's... We live in an eggshell and it's impossible to penetrate the shell. Well, not according to God. Amos 9. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, Smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. And he that fleeth of them shall not flee away and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they, why would they dig into hell? I have heard stories. It's 
all they are is rumors that there are deep underground bases. Deep underground bases. You know, a large majority of UFOs that are seen are didn't come from down from the sky. They rose up out of a large lake or the ocean. True story. Um, but anyway, watch this. This Bible's right. Whether you believe those stories or not, believe your Bible. God said this is what they're going to do. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out of thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent and he shall bite them. It makes you wonder what God has down there in the Marianas Trench, deepest spot in the sea. Places in places, there are places in the sea bottom that we have never seen before. We have no idea what's down there. Not a clue. And God says, even if they go down there, I'll just send a serpent down there and bite them. And then, Obadiah. This is one of my favorite places. I, first time I read this, I went, <gasps> Look at what it says. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, Though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Columbia, Houston, the eagle has wings. Columbia, the eagle has landed. Tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. And their patch says it all. An eagle with a branch in his hand. What do eagles, when they're flying around with a branch, what are they doing with it? Building a nest. What did Trump say was going to be one of our plans? Put a permanent station on the moon. There is a Chinese rover on the backside of the moon. And in the last two weeks, they've spotted something looks like a giant cube in the background about four miles away and the rover is on its way over to it and they cannot figure out why a perfect cubicle building would be on the back side of the moon is it possible that we or somebody has already built a nest among the stars. Yeah, because we already have the International Space Station. That's a nest. Among the stars. Okay. All, a, all an attempt to rise above the clouds to escape the day of the Lord's judgment when the translation of God's saints is the only escape of God's judgment. Now, I've just showed you, let's see here, Job 20, Isaiah 14, Amos 9, Obadiah 1, 3, and 4. Four places in the Bible that says that they're going to try to escape above the heights of the clouds into the heavens. Four verses. I only need two to convince you, three to top it off. But I've got four. 
to sh that are all saying the exact same thing. Now look at this. Russian billionaires, 15 million strong Noah's Ark plan to create space garden of gods. Now this story was updated. I did this story several years ago and it was updated in 2019. A Russian billionaire is ramping up plans to save humanity by creating a floating garden of gods in the solar system for 15 million lucky people. It's not science fiction anymore, people. This is, this is the time we live. William Shatner finally got to go to space. The guy's 90 years old. William Shatner got to go to space, for crying out loud. We live in Star Trek age now. No doubt about it. And, and guess what his space garden of gods is called? Asgardia. Asgard. You know where Thor, the god, lives? Do you know who Manly Hall called Thor? The prince of the power of the air. It's Ephesians chapter 2. <sighs> Jeff Bezos foresees a trillion people living in millions of space colonies. Here's what he's doing to get the ball rolling. And, and why? Why? Number one, these people think that the earth is overcrowded and that First, it was back in the 70s, it was global cooling. Then in the 90s, it was global warming. And then in the 2000s, they couldn't figure out what it was because it kept cooling back off again. So they just said, climate change. Climate change is, is evil and it's, and it's our fault. And we're going to have to save this planet or get off of it. So they're planning to leave. They're planning to leave. And if it's true, if it's true, as Ben Rich, the head of Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works, top guy in building the most advanced aerospace weaponry in the universe, said, we already have the technology to get off of this planet and live anywhere we want to. We already have the technology to take E.T. home. Warp drive, the ability to warp space, travel from A to B in a matter of days, months, instead of hundreds of thousands of years. They say we already have it. I don't know. I can't make that claim. I'm just telling you what the Bible says and what man's got planned. Getting ready for the end of the world. The visuals of Elon Musk working on his fleet of spaceships to Mars while Earth writhes in fear of the pandemic. Global warming and the Taliban taking take over of Afghanistan gives off a when worlds collide vibe. That 1951 movie concerns the desperate efforts to build a space ark to transport a group of men and women to another planet to avoid the coming destruction of the earth by a rogue star. Did you see, you remember seeing back, that we watched it in literature class in high school. The, the, the uh, public, no, it was uh, NBC that made a uh, mini series of The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. And the gist of the movie was getting man off of Earth, getting him on Mars to live on Mars because the Earth was probably going to blow itself up in a thermonuclear war. And it did. And so now you have a few people living on Mars to keep humanity going. Science fiction, folks, is not science fiction anymore. It's not only real, God predicted it. And since God saw it coming, God's got a plan that when they shoot up to whatever 
See, this is why they're trying to spot planets and find one that might be habitable. And as soon as they send one up there at warp speed, God's going to go whoop! Back down to earth you go. You're not escaping this. No way, no how. Um, it will take a thousand spaceships and a million tons of vitamin C to make life on Mars sustainable, says SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. Otherwise, you're going to die slowly and painfully. That's because in order to live on Mars, we need to have a self-sustaining city there. In the present case, the ships are made to bear us away from the multiple disasters for Armageddon is undeniably on our minds. Perhaps it was the subconscious apocalyptic mood that put a recent story that an asteroid could hit Earth in 200 years above the fold or, or drove a headline that a vaccine-resistant Lambda variant was winding its way north from South America. The end of the world has always exercised a foundation for people. It is a very ancient pattern in human thought. It is rooted in ancient, even pre-biblical Middle Eastern myths of ultimate chaos, an ultimate struggle between the forces of order and chaos, says cultural historian Paul Boyer. No more than now. The idea remains current within the, with the destroyer most commonly arriving in the form of climate change. Nope, they're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh as travail upon a woman with child and the destroyer is not going to be a form of climate change the destroyer is going to be where are you and they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the hebrew tongue is abaddon but in the greek tongue hath his name apollyon and both of those words mean destroyer you see they've got it all wrong we're not going to be destroyed from the Omicron variant we're not even going to be destroyed by the vaccine sorry to tell you all you people that we're going to be destroyed by sin in fact, we already are. Haven't you figured that out yet? Haven't you figured it out while you sit on the internet all day long and look for the next thing that's going to kill us or the next thing that's going to be the mark of the beast? First it was, what was it? Something going around in the 90s and then it was the chemtrails and the chemtrails have been blowing now for what, 40 years? Haven't killed anybody. And then it was Comet Ison. That didn't, that didn't do it. And then it was the electrical meters. That didn't do it. And it's just an endless thing on the internet of, of the next thing that's going to kill everybody on the earth. And you're scared to death. But let me ask you born again Christians again. Why are you so afraid of dying? I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of living. That's what I'm afraid of. Down here, I'm afraid of living. Genesis 9. When the cloud comes, the nations that God's going to send, Remember what he said? I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. We know that bow was in... Ezekiel 1 at riding the chariot, the bow and the cloud in the day of rain. This is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's Christ. 
And it shall be for a token, for a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring the bow over the cloud over the earth. Who is it? Who is it that's going to kill everybody on the earth? It's not Fauci. It's not Bill Gates. It's not the Wuhan lab. It's not Pfizer. It's God. God's the one going to do that. When I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So God says that when you see the cloud that he brought over the land, he brought them over the land, that nation, God brought them to kill all the heathen. God said, when I bring the cloud over the land, I will set the bow in the cloud so that you will know I will keep my promise. God always keeps his promise. So the bow is Jesus Christ. He's the glory of the Lord in the cloud. Revelation 9. This, see, this is just my theory that, Revela excuse me, Revelation 10, that the mighty angel that comes down is Jesus because it matches 100%. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. Clothed with a cloud. What was Joseph clothed with? A garment, a coat of what? Many colors. A rainbow. So who is Joseph in this story? Jesus, clothed with the rainbow cloud coat. Do you see that? So here is, he's clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. This is Jesus Christ. And his face was as it were the sun. That's Jesus Christ. And his feet as pillars of fire. That's Jesus. That's God. And he had in his hand a little book open. He just took the book in Revelation 5 and 6 from his father and opened the seals. Now the book is open. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So here's Jesus at his at his glorious appearing now clothed with a cloud right because he said when he comes he's coming in the clouds now let me ask you a question since it's you know about christmas time when jesus came the first time you know when he was born of mary in Bethlehem. Was he wearing any clouds? No. Let's, let's find out if he was. Luke 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Babies like to be swaddled. You tighten, you tighten them up real tight because that's how they used to feel in the womb. But why does the Bible have to go out of its way to tell you he was wrapped in swaddling clothes? Because it's for a reason. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. 
And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And that's twice now that the Bible has gone out of its way, even telling you that the sign that they're going to find the Messiah is that he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. There's only a few places where the word swaddling or swaddled is in the King James Bible. And Job 38 is one of them. God is asking Job a question in verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation to the earth? And then he says, sort of like, where wast thou in verse 9 when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it? And he's talking about the earth. The cloud was the swaddling clothes of the earth. Do you get that? And Mary was wrapping Jesus in the swaddling clothes, which was to represent the clouds of the earth clothing Jesus as she laid him in the manger. Behold, he cometh in the clouds. I love this. I, the King James Bible is the only Bible you'll find anything like that. You won't find it in NIV. You won't find it New English Version, Christian Standard Version. You won't find it. You won't find that anywhere. Mary wrapped Jesus in his swaddling cloud coat, just like Jacob, or I say Jacob, Jacob giving Joseph his coat of many colors, his rainbow cloud coat. Joseph was clothed with a cloud and had the glory of the Lord in the form of the rainbow on him. And now here is Jesus clothed with the cloud at his birth in the form of the swaddling clothes, which are the clouds and thick darkness, the swaddling band of the earth. I love it. I love it. If you walk away from this with anything, I have cloudy days now. I don't know if it's from COVID. I don't know if it's just a, a thorn that God has put in my flesh. Uh, I used to have some other thorns. God's taken them away. But it just seems like I don't get to live in this earth without a thorn so today's a pretty good day yesterday wasn't and I just it just seems like everywhere I went there was a cloud over me couldn't get happy got heard at everything everybody said it's in a deep hole. But I know that every time that cloud comes, I know to look for my Savior in it because He said He would be. So if you don't get anything out of these last two teachings that I've done, if you don't like the prophecy part, you don't like anything, just remember when a cloud comes, it's going to be a rainbow in it. And that rainbow is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ there to take you away. The Lord bless you and keep you. You're the reason why we do what we do here at Bethel. Remember the people of Kenya. Remember our church. Remember me. Thank you for your prayers. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.